everybody. Um, no, we're not the only ones. Um, we've got quite a number of participants already logged in. Um, so I'm going to request okay. that, um, that you, you start uh, the program. Um, and then I'll be letting in participants into the call. Um, we're currently sitting at around 29 participants. Pidu will be joining shortly. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our first webinar. Um, we used to meeting uh, during our network dinner. So what we do is we hold network dinners and we get the opportunity to meet our guest speakers and we get to mingle. Um, however, due to circumstances that we are in now, uh, like COVID-19, COVID I, I was practicing now so that I don't say CODIV. Um, so due to uh, these circumstances, we are forced to think outside the box and, and keep the ball rolling. We, we don't want to wait too long and miss the opportunity to engage on critical issues. So this webinar was um, the baby behind the webinar, thanks to Jeanette, who came up with the idea uh, to say that instead of waiting uh, for the unknown, can we rather continue and, and meet each other and discuss critical issues through a webinar? So this is our first. So please bear with us. We've tried to prepare for you as best as we can. And we really hope that you guys uh, enjoy what we have prepared. Uh, we've got the best of the best in terms of uh, our speakers. I, I, I hope you had the opportunity to look Mam Tandi up uh, so that you can ask her questions that are really um, thought provoking and questions that will help us in our daily lives in terms of improving because that's that, that's basically what we strive for our our network aims to connect professionals across the world and engage on topics um, of upliftment and we really hope it's what you will get out of this and by the way happy workers day and, and yeah, wishing you a, a wonderful day. The fact that you've joined in means um, you're going to have a lovely day. I assure you what the best for you. Um, just also to, to let you know, um, uh, Maru, uh, the gentleman behind all our technical uh, work, um, has hooked us up with a YouTube link. So if any of you are struggling to hear us on Zoom or the network gets too slow, you can click on the link and you can get involved uh, in the conversation on YouTube as well. So yes, please help yourself. Uh, without further ado, um, I am made aware that we've got quite a number of participants who have joined the call. How many participants do we have so far, Maru? Um, we're sitting at uh, 35. Okay, so we're at 35, but I just want us to acknowledge our colleagues from the rest of the world. Uh, so I'm going to just do a quick roll call for other countries. So South Africa, we see you. You are here with our num in your numbers, and thank you for logging in. Um, do we have a representation from Kenya? Wakesho, are you on the line? Yes, I'm on the line. Hi. Welcome, Akesha. Thank you for joining you. us. And on behalf of also the other Kenyans online, thank you for having us. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And then do we have anybody from Ghana? Oh, yes. I'm Kar here. Karina. Welcome, here. Karina. Oh, we have a few others online as well. It's kind of early here, but we're excited to join. Thank you so much for joining in. Do we have anybody from Botswana? Okay, no one yet from Botswana. Do we have anybody from Sierra Leone? Okay, my colleagues are still joining in. Anyone from Nigeria? Okay. Is there anyone from London? Yeah, 
Yes, there is. Um, okay, there. Ha there is from the UK. Yes. So, who do we have from the UK? You have Basaya Yusuf. Hi, Yusuf. Welcome. It's actually Basaya. Nice to meet you. Okay. I hope you guys enjoy your time with us. Um, in case you're wondering, guys, yes, um, the Pan African Leadership Forum Net Networking Forum is international. We do have our footprints in the rest of the world, so I'm not making it up. We are international. All those countries that I've mentioned, um, yes, we've got a footprint in them. Um, thank you, guys. I welcome everyone. Um, just to give us a quick debrief in terms of how it's going to work. So our guest speaker, uh, Tandi Olay, has also joined us. Welcome, Mom Tandi, and thank you so much for giving us your time to engage you and pick your brain. Um, how we will run the, the, the program of today is that we will, we will have our discussions, our discussion topics that we've already shared with you. And while Mam Tandi is presenting, we urge you to post your questions on the, on the chat functionality. Or when you look at your Zoom, Zoom screen, the chat functionality is on your top right-hand side, where you can ask your question. And then our host, Maru, will post the question to Mam Tandi after she has debriefed, debriefed for each theme. Um, we're doing this because we just don't want any feedback and, and, and problems in terms of people unmuting. So we just do it in a format that it's beneficial for everybody. So please don't be shy to post your questions. Uh, without further ado, um, uh, also keep your lines on mute at all times, please. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to um, Itu Meleng, uh, uh, the founder. Uh, who will just give us a background of our forum and also introduce uh, our guest speaker. Over to you, Itu Meleng. Hi there, Koketo. Um, there's just a slight yes. delay from, from Itu Meleng's side. Um, we're just trying to iron out mm -hmm. uh, connectivity issues. Uh, may I ask that we just mm -hmm. step forward in the program and then we'll, jo we'll join in in a few minutes. Okay, so um, we will skip the part uh, about um, how our forum started. I think Itumeleng is best positioned to actually take us through that with his stories. Maybe what we can do is to hand over to, to Mam Tandi to give us a background about herself, a short biography, just so uh, we get an idea of what she's about and how we can engage her. I'm going to hand over to you, Mam Tandi. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful morning. Uh, welcome uh, people from uh, both South, East and West of Africa, as well as I understand we have um, friends from Australia and the UK. We really appreciate everybody joining us. Um, I'm sorry to the West Coast people, uh, when we agreed on 10 o'clock, we thought all of them were one hour behind South Africa. Uh, but we'll uh, make sure that we make up for that. Briefly, uh, I'm a, a lawyer. I'm no longer in practice. At present, um, I'm in business. But my uh, genesis uh, started as a human rights lawyer, representing uh, people who were oppressed and criminalized both for political and economic reasons in, in South Africa. I practiced for about 20 years uh, and uh, during that period, I proceeded to move into employment law, commercial law, continuing to represent either trade unions or um, employees as well as downtrodden people. Uh, it was in the late 90s, post South Africa's democratization, that I decided uh, to link up with other African women so that we could look at areas of conflict in Africa. Uh, with my background in mediation and ar arbitration and board broadly under alternative dispute resolution, uh, we decided to form an organization called Firm Africa Solidarity 
which is a FARS in short, and which is the solidarity of women in English. And we decided to train, empower, and support women in areas like, at the time, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Rwanda, Burundi, the broader Great Lakes region, and uh, on the upper part of the east, oh, the guess Sudan, on and the so street. on. Uh, we have a lot of friends when we are locked down at home, joining us with the children. So in brief, that has been the work uh, that I've done uh, in the early part of the changeover, and thereafter moving into a business, both supporting small businesses, supporting uh, development agencies, uh, and then started sitting on boards. I've sat on from listed companies to unlisted to the Reserve Bank of South Africa, uh, as well as um, not-for-profit organizations. So I regard myself as somebody was involved in the transformation of the country. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Amam Tandi. Um, I've also did a bit of background check on you. I'm sure you did a background check on us. So uh, in times like, like COVID, we've seen how the Reserve Bank is so involved in terms of making sure that we actually survived this and, and ensuring that we maintain our inflation target uh, as per mandate, what was it like sitting on, on a board like a reserve bank? Just name a few challenges, just paint the picture for us. Thank you, Koket. So, uh, I think sometimes there is a misunderstanding of the role of uh, reserve banks because it's the only uh, one of a kind in a country that support the monetary policies of the country. And it is therefore important that it's not equated to commercial banks. And it has got in South Africa and in a lot of jurisdiction, a regulatory oversight over commercial banks to ensure issues of liquidity, to ensure mm -hmm. issues around um, in interconnectedness across the globe in relation to monetary and fiscal policies. So serving on the board as a non-executive director we had fiduciary and governance oversight. It was important that to ensure the transition, particularly at the time, from an apartheid-based economic and monetary system to one that was uh, embedded under the constitution of the country. So there were lots of critical areas of policy changes. Uh, ranging from the financial, as you indicated, Coquetso, issues around how we manage inflation, issues around how we ensure that we support uh, the banking infrastructure in the country. So I spent about 12 years on the bank. Okay, thank you, Mam Tandi. Also to note, Mam Tandi, are you specifically interested in the petroleum industry or, or or the vehicle industry, because uh, we've, I've noted on the boards that you sit on, they're sort of industry related. Is your preference a get towards the petroleum industry or motoring or, or, or how was that decision made? I believe, and it's my philosophy that as the youngest uh, democratically independent country in Africa. Uh, we had to look firstly in the continent and as well as look outside. And uh, whilst African countries have been uh, politically independent since Ghana, uh, uh, I mean, I'm not counting clearly Ethiopia and others that were never enslaved or colonized. Uh, we have had political independence, however, we struggled to get economic uh, sustainability. Mm. And so from being a human rights lawyer and activist, I decided that I needed to use my skills in the economic environment. Hence, uh, as you indicate, I sit on a number of boards that are the bedrock of our economy. I have been in the mining sector, and at present, I'm on three 
what I would call strong pillars of the economy in South Africa, the motor industry serving on the Toyota boards, uh, as well as I chair the BP Southern Africa board uh, that is in the clearly petroleum, petroleum and uh, industry, as well as on, I try to keep my hand on the pulse and ensure that I can support the transformation of the economy in those critical areas. Thank you, Mam Tandi. We've also noted your passion around uh, uh, transformation. I was listening to the interview you had, I think it was in 2017, where you spoke about transformation, specifically when you were going into your BP role. Um, and we've seen you've made waves in that, in that path. Um, that's very commendable. Um, thank you for, for that brief profile, very interesting. Um, Participants, please don't be shy to post your questions. If you've got questions regarding Imam Tandi's uh, background, we will note them and we'll ask her uh, those questions. Uh, I'm going to hand over, I believe Itu Meleng just uh, joined the call now. I'm going to hand over to Itu Meleng to talk, about, to talk a bit about our Pan-African Leadership Networking Forum. Itu Meleng, over to you. Hi, oh, thanks. Um, thanks, Kogetsu. I hope everybody can hear me. You know, sometimes I'm a, a little bit, you know, a challenge, you know, when it comes to these things. Um, good morning, you know, everybody. Uh, just to give a, a brief synopsis, you know, as to what actually inspired, you know, this whole, you know, idea of putting together the Pan-Africanist um, Leadership Networking Forum. Uh, typically, over the years, uh, what has been happening, I've been working on, um, you know, uh, getting young people, you know, to pretty much, you know, explore and get out of, uh, you know, the boundaries of South Africa and explore the world. Uh, so over the years, then, you know, uh, the same young people will proceed into universities and into the world of work. But right now, you know, with COVID-19, uh, and uh, quite a lot has been happening. Uh, so um, this organization, you know, the Pan-African you know, um, Leadership Networking Forum is pretty much, you know, to get South African professionals across all sectors, you know, to interlink and interact, you know, with their counterparts elsewhere on the African continent. It's very crucial that we do and um, begin to really share ideas as to what are the challenges, what could we do better, you know, so as uh, because COVID is gonna be with us, you know, for quite some time to come, the virus will not go away simply because they are easing of restrictions, you know, wherever that may be, you know, on our continent. But, uh, you know, it's crucial, you know, that uh, we actually engage and, um, you know, have the likes of uh, Advocate Olin coming in, you know, to really guide us, you know, and they give us a sense of um, where could the glitches be, you know, a bit, you know, in corporate, you know, or some of us, you know, could be entrepreneurs, you know, and stuff like that. But most importantly, for everybody, be it in Kenya, be it in Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, uh, Botswana, I know also Lesotho, you know, has uh, actually, you know, uh, logged in as well. And uh, some of uh, our African sisters and brothers, you know, who live in London, you know, are also logged in. You know, so it's, it's important that all of us, you know, interlink, interlink and interact and really, really begin to um, plan, you know, on our own, you know, without, you know, uh, outsiders, you know, outside, you know, the, the continent, so to speak have a clear plan as to what are we going to do with Africa, you know, into the future. Uh, so I think uh, the long and short of it, uh, so thanks, you know, for, you know, for giving me the opportunity, is really to um, welcome everybody. And uh, whilst the uh, advocate Olain, you know, has been an anchor in terms of getting all of us together, I hope that uh, after this, you know, uh, meeting from various countries, you know, in Africa, wherever we are, we are now friends, you know, we're brothers and sisters, and then like, you know, let's get together and really, you know, get, um, you know, to discuss, you know, serious issues, you know, as they affect, you know, our various regions and countries and our continent at large. Thanks, Koki. Over, back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Itu, for that. Uh, what you've mentioned, you've touched on, on a very important aspect that I think as, as young people, we are the future of this country. I'm not just saying it. So it's important that we have these um, critical conversations so that we're able to maneuver and 
guide those who come um, after us. Um, so without even further delay, we're going to dive into the first theme. So with COVID-19, a lot of things have, have really changed. I mean, how we work has changed, how people make money has changed. You know, we've seen how retailers need to reinvent their strategy in order to survive in these critical times. So Mamtandi, the implications of COVID-19 on professionals and, and, and entrepreneurs. I mean, sitting on the boards that you sit in, I'm sure you have also witnessed these changes affect the bottom line firsthand. Um, what are the implications for us as professionals and, and entrepreneurs during, during and post lockdown? And how can we um, maneuver uh, during these implications? Would you share with us your thoughts on that? Thank you, Koketso. Um, I'm going to talk from the context of the African continent. Uh, as a continent that uh, has got a very young, uh, a very, a lot of young people, a high percentage of our uh, continental uh, citizenry is very young. And therefore it's important that we contextualize it within ourselves. That's the one thing. And as they uh, speculate that most probably is giving us uh, the edge and the advantage that uh, we had, the, the epidemic has not been as bad in Africa as in other continents. Uh, secondly, uh, we are having countries that are the poorest in the world. And somebody once said, and I'm not going to attribute this to any particular person because quite a number of people are attributed to have said this, that never let a good crisis go to waste. And I believe the young professionals in our continent need to step up need to look at what are the opportunities in relation to what has happened. Uh, the economies are bad. Uh, there is no doubt about that. We have challenges of issues of liquidity. Where people are in the private sector, there's going to be uh, possibilities of retrenchments. And if one has to look, you've got to say to yourself, am I a candidate for a retrenchment? Or am, am I looking at this as an opportunity, either within the company itself or within the new areas that are going to develop post L, L, um, COVID-19 and say to myself, how am I going to position myself? Don't allow things to happen to yourself. You need to have the mindset of saying as a young, African person who is a professional, you've got opportunities that you can start uh, taking risks on. If you've had an entrepreneurial spirit, where can you start looking as you are in most instances working in your own home in a lockdown situation? So those for me are the crit critical ways to look at how you can maneuver through what is seen globally as an economic a depression that has not been seen since the 1920s. Okay, Mam Tanti, thank you so much. But you touched on something that is very true in terms of finding the opportunities to make yourself relevant uh, uh, during these times. I remember just yesterday, I was in a telecon at work and I was pitching a new idea on a new process. And Yes, we have these uh, um, webinars, but funny thing is people do not always show their face. So when we are presenting, you're not able to, to see whether people are for your idea or against it. Then it made me realize that, that I'm, I'm so good at reading people cues when I see them. But when I'm on the telephone and I'm not able to see them, how do I ensure that I really capture people's attention? So. I found myself on the internet trying to see how, it, how can I upskill myself to start presenting to people who I cannot see and make sure that they are truly engaged. Is there something I can do beforehand in terms of to get their buy-in? So you touched on that very important aspect. Um, 
I'm going to hand over to Maru to let us know if we have any questions um, from the panel, from our visitors um, regarding this topic. Maru, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Koketo. Um, currently, we're sitting on 53 uh, participants on the Zoom uh, meeting and an additional five um, on YouTube. Um, so I'm just going through the number of questions, I'll implore the people um, as they join in and they, you know something strikes their, their attention to post their questions. Feel free um, to post your questions. Simply um, start with your name, where you are posting your question from. So say for example, Maru posting it from Pretoria, um, and then followed by your question. And then at the end of each section, we'll read it out. So as they come in, I will notify you. Back to you, Cookie. Okay, uh, I had one question from Hilda who asked um, whether the link, um, the link, the YouTube link will remain available after the webinar, Maru. Do we have an idea in terms of that? Yes, it will. Um, that's part of the support that, that we want to provide to uh, the participants that while while we're having this conversation later on it will be um, available for people to go through and and really absorb some of the information the valuable information that's been shared okay okay i have one question for you mam tandy i mean you mentioned uh, about um we need to open up ourselves to opportunities. If we wanted to explore the entrepreneurial route, we should go for it. In your view, Mam Tandi, um, is this the right time uh, for people to go into the entrepreneurship journey? I mean, I know entrepreneurship by itself is, is, is so tough, you know, but is it the right time for people to venture into their entrepreneurship journey or will that depend on the industry they want to go into? Uh, thanks, Koketo. Um, there's never a right time. Or looking at it differently, any time is the right time. It depends on you, your convictions. It depends on your personal circumstances. And it depends on the industry that you are looking at and what support structures you have around you. Uh, I've uh, just found out this morning that a lady who was in the a mainstream uh, financial services just dropped her job, resigned, and has started a factory in an area in South Africa that has been the bedrock of clothing in Singa in KwaZulu-Natal. And uh, these factories had closed at the time that uh, the competition from China could not be met by the local manufacturers. So she's opened a factory, has employed 50 people, and they're making masks, they're making sanitizers, and she's looking at other issues. So it's difficult to say. She has seen the gap, she has taken it, and she's now trying to market herself, and she was on a mainstream television uh, program this morning in South Africa. I've been approached by young people who want to be in the energy sector, and they've indicated what their interests are. And uh, what I normally do as I engage with young people is to say, how old are you? Do you have family responsibilities? Mm. Do you have bonds to pay? And that may be the right time for you because other than what is on your back, you don't have mm. to take a responsibility for anybody else. Mm. Whereas if you've got a seven month old baby, uh, you are in a secure position right now, you've got to say to yourself, can I afford to lose yeah. this? Yeah. So it's each person has really got to do self-reflection at this time. But the opportunity when the economy is low, as I um, understand Warren Buffett has once said, that when they fear, you must go in. And when they go in, you must fear. Mm. Very profound. Um, do we have any questions yet, Maru? Because I see okay. chat trickling in. All right. Um, we've got a question from um, Umogi uh, Elekia. 
Um, and uh, Mogi is saying, which opportunities are presented by this COVID crisis, especially in the legal profession? And how can professionals in the legal sector navigating through this tough time? Uh, thanks, Maru. I suppose I'm being asked this question because I'm in that profession. Um, there are a number of opportunities that have presented themselves. I know of young people uh, who are putting up an app uh, for uh, lawyers uh, to link up. I know of a number of, so if you use whatever profession it is, I can even go to the medical profession where there's also now a, a distant um, examination. But uh, each and every profession, you've got to say to yourself, how can I engage with my clients? I think Koketso gave a very important uh, uh, example. You may have to go to a voice clinic now to make sure that you modulate your voice, you have to go and think about what is the best way to present yourself either without being seen, either without having a, or being on a video link. Uh, however, the critical thing is to look at what are the legal areas that are coming to the fore. Clearly IT, IP, uh, and other, a, a, a myriad of other areas that you can upskill yourself as you have slowed down in your pra practice at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we've got another question uh, from um, uh, Echo from Ghana. This is a um, question for Madame Tandi. What are critical industries that you foresee leading the economic recovery post COVID um, in Africa? Okay, Mary, I'm going to pause on that because that question really ties in with our theme number three. So I'm going to ask that we park that question for when we get to, to theme three, then we can tackle it a bit. Let me move on to the second theme. Um, but I believe we've already touched on how can one be adaptive and adaptable. Uh, Mam Tandi, what are your views on the new normal? What do you think the new normal uh, will be during and post lockdown? Talking to young people like yourselves, it is so critical to be agile and to be norm and to be uh, to be adaptable. The new normal is that we are seeing the fourth industrial revolution coming to us. We are not going to it. It is coming to us. And how do you manage that? The new normal is sitting now at home. Um, as you can imagine, I'm an over 60 years old person. I have been in South Africa in terms of the new regulation. I've been told that I've got to still stay at home under level four uh, because I'm one of the vulnerable people. So now one would say, well, you should be pensioned anyway. But as long as I think young, as long as I feel I've got something to contribute, I'm starting to think of new ways. In my field of practice, uh, for instance, uh, before the lockdown, I was supposed to have done a disciplinary inquiry that involves a senior executive. So I've said to the company, why don't we do it uh, virtually? You know, send me the documents, let's make this happen because you can't keep it hanging on. What if we can't open up as the legal profession fully until the end of the year? The company can't operate in that environment. So the new norm is to be adaptable. We will most probably get back to our offices, but it is critical that we don't see the office as the be all and end all. Okay. So for me, it's very critical. Thank you. Thank you, Ma'am Chandi. Uh, uh, now I'm gonna loop in the question that Echo has asked. Um, with this uh, COVID-19, what are the emerging uh, markets that we are seeing that are going to come up? Or what are the 
evolving industries that are going to come, uh, come up either in the short term or in the long run, Mamtan, your views? Okay. Uh, in the, you, I'm talking to young professionals, people that would be uh, most probably planning or having young families. Uh, agile working is very important for you. Uh, and therefore, it is very important to look at the uh, areas that would be very uh, open to agile working. If I give an example of a BP where um, I'm the chair, we have been promoting agile working long before uh, COVID-19. And so when this happened, it was easy because everybody had a laptop, everybody had connectivity, the system mm. enabled people to just on the Monday pick up their laptops and be home and be able to operate as if they were in the office. So generically, that is very important. Specifically talking about industries, Clearly in Africa, as they or normally as have said, they said all the politicians, everybody who could get into a plane and go to Europe for medication can't do that. People have got to look inward in Africa now. That is an opportunity. You've got to say to yourself, what ways can we ensure that in the continent we can be self-sufficient around health? The second area, We've always been said to be the food basket of the world, but we have not taken advantage of that. They're always saying that China wants to come to Africa because then they can start engaging with food issues in the continent. We have to take advantage of that ourselves. I know in people's minds they say, but we don't have the capital. Find it, this is an opportunity to look at it and find ways on how you can partner, how you can link up, how you can work to make your dreams a reality. Thank you, Mam Tandi. Maru, I've seen a few questions. Do we have uh, questions from Mam Tandi? Yes, uh, we've got um, a very interesting question here um, with regards to the, the fintech industry. Um, and it's from Ife. Ife Olu. Um, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Um, and it says, what opportunities are there for fintech industry in Africa, uh, particularly at this time? Uh, that is a very broad question. And I'm trying to understand when he says fintech, uh, whether he means in a specific area or across the board. Um, well, uh, maybe to give some, some, some uh, background, uh, FinTech, for those that may, may not be familiar with it, it's providing financial solutions um, enabled by technology. So, for example, uh, e-commerce, uh, people buying online, uh, people sharing their, their services online. Um, so, I would imagine that um, you know, the question is based around what opportunities are there uh, for, for fintech industry in Africa, given this, um, this global pandemic that's got everyone um, locked down. Okay. Thank, thanks, Maru, for helping in that, in uh, explaining that and expanding on that. That area uh, of a uh, development has already been with us. One has got to say within the continent, because we've had, because it transcends geographic boundaries. Uh, you can be sitting anywhere in the world and you would be able to engage with it without being in that area specifically. But how is it targeted to the continent? So it's very critical for one to research this because you may be getting into a space that is already crowded. And therefore, it's quite critical in terms of saying to yourself, uh, at what level do I enter into this area? The, for instance, if you look at the banks at the upper end, they clearly have been looking at it. I mean, there's been movement in South African context 
of uh, companies that, that started as um, medical aid uh, uh, sector companies that have moved into that area right now. I take you know a number of examples. And there's other companies that have done a similar thing where you say you register as a financial service advisor or agent and so it's where you want to play the area that has been very interesting has been the lower end of the market how do you penetrate that I mean if you take these small issues not small but the areas where Kenya had already started with Purcell where there's been quite a number of areas that are uh, local people sometimes supported by international players have moved into. And so you've got to say to yourself, do I run with this on my own? How is the competition looking like? Or do I link up with an international partner? So there's lots of thinking to do in this area. Uh, just to also add on with that, I mean, given that our platform, this specific one is international, maybe we do have opportunities to collaborate with each other so that we can make things happen. So let us, let's also use this particular platform to engage each other and to form partnerships that can make a positive impact in our economy. Okay. Any more questions, Maru? Um, not at this stage from, from the panel uh, and also on YouTube. But from my side, um, I wanted to, to just pick your brain there, Mam Tandi, with regards to that fintech industry opportunities in, in Africa. Um, what, would, what would the, the risk be? Say, for example, I'm selling a product. Uh, what would the, the legal implications be if I um, buy online um, a product, say, for example, from, from Ghana or from Nigeria, and I'm here in South Africa? Um, and I have a product uh, complaint, um, which, which legal uh, route would I take? Who would be um, responsible for handling that legal issue? Would it be South Africa? Would it be uh, where the product is from? Um, maybe if you could give me some guidelines there. Already, if you look at other areas uh, or other uh, service providers in this area. You look at uh, an Amazon, you look at uh, Alibaba uh, that are operating cross-border or in other sectors uh, where there's Apple cross-border operations, there is the small print. And, uh, and it's, it's small as a print, but it's a long document. I've tried to go through those documents as a lawyer. I cannot understand in terms of the law how we can expect ordinary people to appreciate those things. But at the end of the day, you are bound. The moment you say yes, you are bound. It's a legally binding document. And you'll find that when you read it, it's either, for instance, will say that uh, for, if you look at the Apple one, it will give the jurisdiction of the US, and then outside of the US, it may say then it's the UK or the European. You know, so you, we will see in those documents. So if you are going to deal with it, as where do you have an advantage? Unfortunately, in a lot of ways, our legislative frameworks in Africa are still very weak and they have not caught up with these areas. So it's important that as lawyers and as uh, business entrepreneurs, uh, you engage with the legislative framework and to understand how you can keep some of the uh, jurisdiction. I know for instance, in arbitrations, I'm an arbitrator, most of the time we find contracts saying that although the uh, area of jurisdiction is in Africa, although the parties are operating in Africa, but the legal jurisdiction is put outside of Africa. And we know that in terms of exchange rate, that's expensive. We know in terms of geographic distance, it's expensive. So it is a disadvantage to agree to such terms. It's a critical, critically important point that you make. 
Thank you very much. Okay. So it's all over to you. Thank you, Ma'am Tandy. Okay, I'm going to, 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 to ask you, Ma'am Tandy, in, this, um, in these times that we, we're going through, I mean, as young professionals and as entrepreneurs, what are the five nuggets of advice would you, would you give us, you know, uh, uh, broadly put so uh, in our career space, in the economy, uh, in our entrepreneurial journey, what, what five nuggets of advice would you, would you give for us? Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, I always relish having to deal with this question because um, despite anything that you may think, we were once young and uh, we also faced the same challenges. Uh, the first advice I would give uh, in relation to a young professional is whether you are single, but this talks particularly to young professionals who are in a relationship, uh, whether you are uh, living together or you are married in whatever form, is that it is important to have conversations. Uh, as a woman professional myself, I've had a, who started her career in the early 80s uh, in a traditional, very um, male, dominated environment, you find the challenges of trying to advance yourself that they are obstructed all the time. And the obstructions tend to start in the home because there's no clear communication and understanding of what are the expectations and what are the ambitions of both parties. For instance, I give this example. One of my partners, is uh, married and they had three sons who are about the same age now. And they decided early on that the husband was going, an engineer, was going to be the one who stays at home and uh, the wife was going to be the one who is going to be the financial provider because she could in that environment. And because they were bringing up boys, they decided that a father figure was a stronger one to be at home. And that worked very well. And this is now over 35 years of marriage. So those are very important in a young professional couple or you are planning to at some point to keep in mind. The second important thing is that uh, when we are young, we look at all the demands, particularly family demands, material demands. As Africans, we're looking beyond our nuclear family. It is important that you already think for the future. Start saving as early as possible. It is very important, and we always in my household talk about the 10 rand or $10 that you split into 3331, and the one is the one that you save. So you can split the other nine into various ways, but the one dollar or one rand is the one that you save. So that is my second advice, because that will hold you in good stead in terms of discipline, in terms of the proverbial rainy day. The third advice that I would like to give because you asked me for five. <laughs> the third advice that I would like to give to young people is that you have to always look at the next level. You must always make sure you skill yourself. You upskill yourself to make yourself ready for the next opportunity. What I've seen in the work environment, uh, particularly for Black people and Africans in that sense in a very cosmopolitan environment uh, and women particularly is that they can't sell themselves. So you find that your colleagues move faster than you. Whilst your skills may be the same, your experience, you may even be working harder, but somehow you are invisible find ways to make yourself visible. 
So it's different ways. You must find ways to network. You must find ways to make sure that what is your work is attributed to you. Nobody steals your work, as it were. Yeah. So that is very important in the workplace. The fourth, for me, critical, uh, as I was a professional, young, having young children, was to put systems around me to enable me to advance. What is maybe seen by Europeans as unusual is that in Africa, throughout, because of the levels, different levels of poverty and, uh, and education, uh, we can have fair domestic work, housekeeping. Make sure that you've got the right people. I'll give a simple example. When you're a young professional, you are trying to advance yourself, your kids are starting school. Make sure that in the $9 that you have, you get an au pair or somebody who can make sure that they help your kids so that when you get home, you are able to play with them and not be wrestled about cooking, kind of things, factor them into your lifestyle to ensure that as a professional, you can give as much. Because I know young professionals says, we can't do it all. Of course, you can't do it all on your own. You need the support systems. And granny cannot be that support system. Mm. She can help, but she can go so far. Mm. And lastly, in Africa as young people, this is your legacy. This is your legacy. If you don't take this COVID-19 as an opportunity to say, as Africans, whether you are in the diaspora or you are within the geographic uh, boundaries of the continent, how can we uplift this continent? We complain about corrupt leaders, we complain about systems, but how can we? I always give the example of South Africa, and it could happen to any country, that the generation of Nelson Mandela, they fought for freedom. And they were fortunate to hand it over to us. The next generation tried to give South Africa an economic platform. They haven't done it for everybody. But it's mm -hmm. now up to this generation to say, what is our contribution, having received the political uh, emancipation to economic emancipation? If you don't do that, entrepreneurs from outside will come and exploit the continent all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's up to us to say, how can we make sure that the continent advances? You, we've got the next 30 to 50 years. If we don't do that in the next 30 to 50 years, you'll always be the dark continent. So I hope those five will help you to think through the next post-COVID journey. Thank you, Mam Tandi. You've actually said a mouthful and, and most of the advice that you've given actually like touches home. I mean, most of us can relate with the advice that you've just given. Um, do we have any questions from our participants? Um, currently, we don't have uh, questions uh, pertaining to the themes uh, that we had touched on. and. Uh, uh, we did have a question with regards to what constitutes a good leader um, uh, from Masichab, I believe, in South Africa. Um, however, um, given the, the interest of time, I think you have also covered um, you know, some, some key nuggets. I would like to um, you know, patch over to, to Idu uh, to maybe share some words from his side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maro. I'm, I'm just wondering how much time do we have left so far? Uh, because uh, I actually would like to ask, you know, uh, our friends, you know, uh, in Kenya and in Ghana, just to give us a, a quick sense of uh, what's happening in their countries and uh, how they are, you know, uh, handling the current situation. I think without any further ado, um, uh, Wakesha, shall we hand over to you? 
after which I will hand over to Karina in Ghana. Thank you. Uh, hi, E2. So, of us uh, speaking from my side as a lawyer and probably in general, um, things are a bit slow. We had a uh, you know, a curfew in place and a partial lockdown kind of situation. Most of us are working from home. And um, so, as uh, mom said, it's, uh, we're all trying to be agile and to adapt to the situation. Uh, most of us have, you know, started to look outside the box, um, you know, like trying to find other opportunities, whether in business, to try and engage with each other. Um, also, as she spoke about upskilling, um, I've seen a lot of these webinars are taking place. So we are also taking the opportunity to keep learning, to keep um, adding new skills. But overall, um, I know there's just the sense that this has to, you know, end soon for us to, you know, go back to life as it used to be, but then again, we've said this is the new normal. So taking up all the lessons that have been learned now to the future. Okay, no, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Inawa Kesho. Um, uh, shall we have Karina in Ghana or Morning. any person um, uh, So to give a bit of an update here, we had partial lockdown of cities of Kran, Kamasi and surrounding areas. Uh, but it was lifted two weeks ago on Monday. So we're slowly adapting to the new normal. And to be honest, when I look at the response here in comparison to the response of some of the European countries and the US states, I think we're doing quite well. So uh, face masks are mandatory um, at all kind of public stations or ATMs. You have to wash your hands, you have to use hand sanitizer. I know that there's a number of organizations in Ghana that have adapted and are now producing hand sanitizer and they're producing face masks. Um, but our numbers are still rising. So right now we're at around 2074 and with only 17 deaths though. Um, so I, th I think we have a, a while to go, but on the whole, like I think our government have, stro have shown leadership and strength. And um, yeah, so let's let's see what the new normal looks like here. Uh, terrific, thanks, Karina. Um, I know we've got uh, some people who are um, from um, from our continent, but based in London. And I know we also have, um, you know, um, our, one of our greatest friends, you know, in Australia, in Victoria, uh, Alan McLean. Um, you know what, shall we start uh, with uh, anybody in London just to give us a quick synopsis, please? Somebody raise your hand. Okay, if we don't have uh, anybody coming in, you know, uh, from London, um, I don't know, let me see, I'm just actually checking, you know, or the, the participants here. Um, is Alan still on, uh, still on, Maru? Yes, he's still with us. Um, Maru is there. Yeah, let me, let me oh, try yeah. and look him in. Want to, want to please ask Alan to, to share something with us on his side in Australia? Mm. Yeah, the our, our federal national cabinet met today and they've decided to meet again next day. We see some restrictions eased. Um, we've got basically self-isolation, um, essential travel only, pubs, restaurants all closed, even our iconic you know, shopping centres have been closed. The government has introduced an app called COVID Safe. This is an app where um, been obviously questions about privacy, but it works on a Bluetooth system where it'll simply um, register any phones near you. And then if one of those people that went near you later is uh, tested positive for COVID-19, the health authorities can then track who was near that person via the phone and send you an alert to say that you need to go and get tested. The government is saying that they will proceed to these restrictions if they get 40% of the population signed up. 
at the moment, after three days, there's been 3.5 million people download the app. It's a long way to go, but the government is reassuring everybody that it's not tracking your movements. It's simply going to help us track you if you're exposed to COVID in another way. Our different states and territories are doing things a little bit different, but we have had a national cabinet formed, which means that the Prime Minister and the Premiers of each state are meeting pretty much weekly um, to try and be consistent. Schools have been a big area of discussion. Um, the Federal Chief Health Officer is saying that schools are safe for children to return, but uh, in Victoria, they're saying not yet. So there's still a bit of an issue about schools. And also, of course, sport. Um, most sports have been closed. And there's talk now, May, June, they'll perhaps open um, to close stadiums. So that's what's... And of course, the economy. Um, I guess when I say we're heading to double our unemployment rate, um, which will be 10%, that probably may sound very low to you. Um, that we did have an unemployment rate of 5% and it's now predicted to go to 10. And the government's predicted to have a $1 trillion debt um, by the time this is all over. Terrific, no, terrific. Thanks, uh, thanks, Alan. You know, uh, we really appreciate you know, your input. You know, uh, we kind of like now have a sense of what's happening, you know, around the world. I'm not sure if uh, it's Olu. Olu, are you around? Are you still logged in? Can you give us a sense of what's happening in London? Okay, that's fine. Uh, if, uh, if Olu is... Um, not able to come in and uh, give us a sense of what's going on, you know, uh, in his, uh, where he's uh, currently, you know, based. I think let's hand back to you, you know, uh, okay, so, you know, so that you can carry on with the program. Thank you. Thank you, Itu. Um, we've actually come to, to the end of our program if we don't have any more questions. Um, I'd like to extend my gratitude towards Mam Tandi for taking out time to engage us on this topic. Uh, for most of us, it has been eye-opening, you know, uh, especially the points where you've mentioned that if we don't do something now for our country or, or penetrate specific markets, start your entrepreneurial journey, then the time... It's, it's, it's either now or never, because this is your time to make your mark. So in that regard, Mam Tandi, thank you so much. Um, okay. Okay, the questions that are, that are coming in have to do more with the organization than the, the themes. So we'll take that offline. Guys, I am noting your questions. I think they will be addressed in the Pan-African Leadership Network Forum. Um, yes, but in general, Mam Tandi, thank you so much for taking out time to be with us. Um, if there's nothing else, guys, I'm going to have to say this is the end of our webinar. Oh, yes, it. Itu? <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, yeah just, uh, you know, uh, a few, you know, announcements, you know, uh, the, well, Thank you. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. I must you. thank uh, okay, Olen. Okay, I must thank okay, Olen, you know, for making time, you know, uh, to to be with us this morning, and also, you know, a sincere gratitude, you know, uh, to um, Wakwesho and uh, our friends, all our friends in Kenya, uh, Karina, Eko, uh, Olu, and all our fr other friends, you know, in West uh, in West Africa. Um, Alan, thanks for coming in. I know it's a uh, you know dinner time, you know, for for you now. You know, in Australia, um, what we now, what's going to be happening going forward? You know, we are planning on having these webinars. You know, at least a, you know, a two, one, one, and perhaps you know, twice, once or twice in a month. You know, and then there'll be different, you know, themes. You know, that need to be covered. You know, we needed to kick off, you know, with the one. Uh, like, you know, today's theme on professionalism, uh, you know, those who are entrepreneurs, things that really affect our pockets. But you'll know that also Advocate Olaine talked about, 
you know, relationships, you know, uh, like uh, be it husband and wife at home or those who are living together, you know, that type of thing. And then uh, most importantly, you know, how do women navigate, you know, uh, through these things and actually advance themselves, you know, in a male dominated, you know, environment. You know, so uh, some of the themes, you know, uh, let's say, I think in the next uh, two to three weeks, we'll have somebody who will pretty much, you know, uh, talk about, you know, our male, female relationships and how to make sure that, especially as African men, we're very supportive, you know, towards, you know, uh, African women and women in general. Uh, I think on that note, I will just leave it there and say once again, thanks everybody for coming in and uh, I will leave it to you quick. So, you know, to wrap up and um, Guys, uh, please, uh, Maru Etsane, uh, Jeanette Ma uh, Masirumule, uh, and of course, Kogetsu have done so well. And uh, thanks again, you know, to you guys. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, let me just leave it to you, you know, Kogetsu to wrap up and uh, we can all log out. Okay, Mam Tandi, just last question for me. If people want to get in touch with you, how do we get hold of you? Are you on LinkedIn or, or, or how do you prefer us to engage you? I, I try to be with it and be on a number of platforms. I'm still getting myself on Instagram because I'm told that must be the <laughs> in platform. I'm not there yet, uh, but I am on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. I'm on, on Twitter and uh, I'm on Facebook. So I'll be happy to engage uh, with people. And I really would thank you for inviting me to participate. I enjoy uh, engaging with young people uh, believe, because I believe it keeps me young and hopefully uh, we can share because there's lots of experiences from the young to us older people or mature people and from us to the young. So really you are doing a great job and thanks Itu for keeping the flag all these years and continuing to engage young people. All the best. Thank you, Mom Tandi. Uh, to everybody, please stay safe. And yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Okay.